Timeline of the Treaty. C-1800 Early Mauryan European Contact A pattern of contact was established between Mauryan Early Whalers and Sealers. Europeans, or Pke, numbered barely a handful in any one place, and they often lived as guests of the estimated 100,000 more in their distinct and independent tribal regions. Early interaction with ships visiting to trade or take trees, for ships spars, sometimes led to misunderstandings and violence. Crewmen sometimes broke local taboo or mistreated Mori, and occasionally openly plundered, for which Mori sought to do satisfaction by attacking the ships. This occurred with the Fancy in 1795, the Royal Admiral in 1801, the Elizabeth, the Serengapitam and the Parramatta in 1808, and culminated with Her Majesty's transport to Boyd and Wangaroa in 1809, where the ship was attacked and burnt. The subsequent massive retaliation, however, fell on the wrong village. 1814 Marsden's mission arrived. Samuel Marsden, the Anglican chaplain to the British penal colony in New South Wales, was one of the first missionaries in New Zealand. Despite an earlier visit in 1807, a church missionary society, CMS, mission was not established at Rangiawa until December 1814. Three lay missionaries, William Hall, Thomas Kendall and John King, accompanied Marsden, who preached a sermon to Mori on Christmas Day. This was interpreted for them by local chief Ruatara, who had earlier met Marsden in England. Marsden purchased a supply ship for the mission, the active, and this was sent on a preliminary voyage in June 1814. At the same time, offenses committed against Mori, whether on land or on board ships, led to Thomas Kendall being appointed as resident magistrate in the Bay of Islands by New South Wales Governor Macquarie. This was New Zealand's first judicial appointment. 1831 Mori chiefs petitioned British government lawlessness by sailors, escaped convicts and adventurers from New South Wales began to increase, and there were growing fears of French annexation of New Zealand. Therefore, at the suggestion of New South Wales Governor Darling, missionary William Yate assisted 13 northern chiefs to prepare a letter to King William IV, asking for his protection and signed with their moco. The fear of unscrupulous sailors had increased after the Elizabeth affair, when her captain allowed the vessel to be used in a Gaito raid from Kapiti on Gaitahu in Akarawa. The British Crown acknowledged the petition and promised protection. 1832 Busby appointed British resident, in order to protect Mori, the growing number of British settlers and its own trade interest, the British government appointed James Busby as its official resident, a sort of junior consular representative, without effective powers, because New Zealand was not within British jurisdiction. He arrived in May 1833, and built a house on land he bought at Watangi. Described as a man o war naval warship without guns, he was unable to exert much control over British subjects beyond mere persuasion or much influence over Mori. 1835 The Declaration of Independence in response to a perceived threat of French annexation, Busby drew up, without authorization from his superiors, a Declaration of Independence, which was signed by 34 northern chiefs. Additional signatures, including some from further south, were added over the next four years. This group referred to themselves in the declaration as the Confederation of Chiefs of the United Tribes of New Zealand, although there is no evidence that the Confederation was ever convened again, except at the time of the signing of the treaty in 1840. It received a puzzled, and rather lukewarm reception at the colonial office in England, which was well aware that New Zealand was not a British possession, and did not want to take responsibility for it. The colonial office, advised by the missionary societies, was by no means convinced that there was a viable political authority in New Zealand with which it could form diplomatic relations. The declaration was, however, acknowledged by the British government. Some historians suggest it was not taken seriously until it proved to be an impediment to the annexation of New Zealand. It is thought that for this reason the document was used for calling up chiefs to sign the Treaty of Watangi on 6 February 1840.
Other experts view the declaration as an embryonic expression of Mori nationhood which, in conjunction with other events in the 1820s and 1830s, shows that the Treaty of Watangi was part of a negotiated relationship, and not the beginning of European power, and the end of Mori sovereignty. 1835-40 Concern over Mori welfare in the late 1830s, following on from the report of the Select Committee on Aborigines, 1836-1830. Seven, and the House of Lords inquiry into the present state of the islands of New Zealand, 1838, many humanitarians became concerned about the harmful effects to Mori of exposure to the various groups of Europeans that arrived here. Missionaries intervened to discourage land sales, sometimes buying land themselves, at least partly in the role of trustees, to enable Mori to retain access. They and others from New Zealand, Australia, and England pressured the British government to prevent the spread of immoral behavior as well as the introduced diseases that were causing the population to markedly decline. Given Busby's inability to act, the preference was eventually for annexation and direct government. 1837 Britain to establish colony from its experience in other parts of the world. The British government had found that colonies involved great expense and difficulty. As a result it had initially tried to avoid assuming responsibility in New Zealand. Instead it had tried to influence the interaction of Mori and British settlers through the missionaries, and by sending Busby, to try to work with the Rangatira, chiefs, in the north. Busby reported pessimistically on his efforts, and on the increasing number of land transactions, that British settlers and New South Wales speculators were making with local chiefs. British settlers at Corbrica, now called Russell, petitioned King William IV in March 1837 for protection, and expressed their disapproval of Busby's proceedings. Officials at the colonial office agreed that the state of New Zealand is soon sick to be lamentably bad, and Mr. Busby has long been regarded as unfit for office. In December 1837, understanding that colonization to no small extent was already happening in New Zealand, the British government, led by Lord Melbourne and Lord Glenelg, decided that it had to intervene to ensure that colonization was regulated, and that land transactions that defrauded Maori were stopped. By mid-1839, the British government had decided to annex at least part of New Zealand to New South Wales. 1838-39 Land Sharking Peaks purchasers raced to buy as much land as they could. Apart from the few who wanted relatively small areas for their own settlement, large-scale speculators were putting pressure on Mori all over the country to enter into the flimsiest of deals, often for huge areas. Missionaries petitioned London to intervene to protect Mori. Some of the largest alleged purchases included W.B. Rhodes, who claimed to have bought Kapiti, Banks Peninsula, Wellington and most of Hawke's Bay, the last for £150, semicolon Daniel Cooper, who claimed to have purchased 133,000 hectares of the Hawke's Bay, Cape Turnagain and Table Cape Districts for £383, semicolon, and especially the New Zealand Company, which claimed to have bought some 20 million acres, effectively the middle third of New Zealand from New Plymouth to Banks Peninsula. Within only a few months, 1839 William Hobson appointed with the New Zealand Company in the process of dispatching colonists from London, the British government decided to appoint naval officer Captain William Hobson as consul. Hobson left England shortly after the New Zealand Company's first ship, the Tory. He was instructed to obtain sovereignty over all, or part of New Zealand with the consent of a sufficient number of chiefs. New Zealand would come under the authority of Sir George Gibbs, Governor of New South Wales, and Hobson himself would become Gibbs' Lieutenant Governor. Land buying agents continued swarming over New Zealand in anticipation of purchasing opportunities being cut off by Hobson. It was later calculated that their combined claims amounted to more than New Zealand's total land area.